So we want to talk to, or I guess about, the movers and shakers of the mortgage industry. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they've made some big changes this year that affect home buyers. So we're going to cover all of those today. Does that all sound good? Them. That all sounds like a lot. Well, as many as you can educate why, us on. We'll see. So why is this important to everybody out there? So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they buy the mass majority of conventional conforming loans, which makes up about 60, I'd say 60% of our marketplace. So the changes that are made to them are going to affect the vast majority of buyers and realtors and, and mortgage people out there. So the conforming loans, those are anything that's government backed, correct? No. Okay. Conforming loans. Educate us. Okay. Conforming. Thank you. I, I know you took one for the team on that one, but <laughs> conforming loans are, uh, there's two different kinds of loans. There's conventional and non or conventional and government. Conventional is anything that's not a government loan. A government loan would be VA, FHA, USDA. A conventional loan could be a conforming loan, which means it conforms to the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac standards, or it could be non-conforming, which means it doesn't. So portfolio loans or certain jumbo loans and things like that. So this is affecting the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, purchased loans. Um, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are government-sponsored entities. This is way too much info. <laughs> but government-sponsored entities... Um, that purchase loans to create liquidity to more loans to be made. I think that's the easiest way to put it. So really what's going on is they're making some changes. There's two different things going on, actually. They're making changes to their what's called their DU and LP. And these are the automated underwriting systems in the background. I was going to so, say that sounds like a lot of acronyms. I'm so sorry. <laughs> these are This is the computer underwriter that makes decisions. When you, when you put in an application, you run it through their system, and it tells you if it's good or or not good. So it's not the loan officer, it's the underwriter that's making that decision. It's the underwriting system. Gotcha. Okay, the loan officers just make sure, you know, their job is to, you know, make sure that they get the right information mm -hmm. from the clients. You know, they, they're the voice of the transaction, depending on where you work, where the loan officer is, they, they could be pre underwriting files. Um, some of at our company, the underwriters underwrite the files. Um, the, the loan officers make sure everyone's you know kept in touch and communication. But we're not here to talk about that. So let's just go back a step. The so there's two different changes that are ma major changes that are happening. One is to that underwriting engine in the background, and the other is to the pricing, and they're called loan level pricing adjusters. So to the pricing and to the qualifications. Okay. So let's talk about the the. Um, the update to the to the DU and LP or the underwriting engine, they are gonna they are gonna be a little bit more stringent on marginal borrowers. Okay, marginal borrowers being people that might be right on the cusp of whether or not they're gonna qualify. Correct. Okay. So let me give you an example. Um, if let's say we pre-approved a borrower six months ago, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we ran it through, we, we looked at their income, their assets and their credit. We got all, collected all their information, put the accurate information in and we ran them through the system and they might've had a slightly higher debt to income ratio. And that's if you calculate all your outstanding monthly debt obligations, like car payments, student loans, credit cards, um, house payments, things like that. And you divided it by your gross monthly income, it would give you a debt to income ratio. So it's basically all the money you owe versus how much you bring in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that ratio typically, you know, 45% is typically the, on the high end, you can exceed that with compensating factors, possibly up to 50%, you know, just depends on the file. Compensating factors are things like time on job. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, you have, um, uh, money in the bank, things like that. Okay. So uh, what we're looking at is now the system, you know, even though I got an approval six months ago, but they they didn't find a house yet. So they're out shopping. If, if those updates and the pre-approvals aren't being up, updated, mm -hmm. um, we might run it again after these new new system is, and we might not get an approval for marginal borrowers. I was going to say the market's changed so much in the past six months. What are some of those things that might be kind of putting someone on the cusp? Would it be insurance, not just the DTI, but would it be insurance or things like that that might come back and, and kind of kick them back out of being pre-qualified? Well, sure. Or pre-approved? So, I mean, but... Let's just say everything else is equal. Okay. Okay. Nothing changes. The, the the let's just pretend that they knew exactly what that principal interest and taxes insurance payment was going to be on their new house, and they qualified a couple months ago. If they're marginal, meaning their debt to income is high, or you know their their uh, fu like reserve funds—that's money you have left over after closing—is is low, 
or you know, the, depending on all these different factors, there's a lot of different factors. Loan to value, how sure. much they're putting down, you know, how much their debt to income, how much reserves or assets they have, time on job. So the algorithm, <laughs> that's a fancy word for the background <laughs> of this computer underwriting engine, um, might now say, look, you're not approved. Gotcha. And so that that's not good. Right. And there's nothing. No, especially if you were anticipating moving into a house. <laughs> Correct. Well, the, the key here is to make sure, and this is a takeaway, but make sure you get, um, you know, if you are, if your credit score is a little lower, if your debt to income is a little higher, just make sure you're staying on top of it. You know, if, if you're, if you're a realtor or a loan officer out there, go back and look at those marginal borrowers. If you had credit under 700, if your debt to income was over 43 or 44%, give it a little margin of error, mm -hmm. go back and, and reevaluate those customers and help help them make sure yeah. that they're still good once this no update surprises. happens. No surprises, no surprises. We do not like surprises. <laughs> so when are these things going to be going into effect? So that's a great question. And I believe that the new underwriting engine, uh, we're starting uh, is February 25th. Okay. But I would just assume now, you know, I would, I would, you know, just get ready to update it now. Um, but that's for the loan. That's for the, the underwriting engine piece. That's the first piece we're talking about is qualifications. Mm -hmm. So obviously if, like you said, if the, uh, the homeowner's insurance, um, you know, make sure that when you're qualified or get, if you're a loan officer, if you're qualifying someone, guess high on these things, guess high on taxes. Mm -hmm. if, if they don't have a property yet, guess high on homeowner's insurance, you know, if you don't know the property, because in the state of Florida, homeowners insurance can be all over the place. Right. Give right? yourself a buffer. Yep. Um, but the, so this is something that real estate agents need to take. You know, if you're taking someone out and they have an old pre-approval, you might want to ask for an updated one. How can a real estate agent have that conversation ahead of time without scaring their their clients or their borrowers? Well, well, you know, one thing is that most pre-approvals they only they have an expiration date on it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're only good for 30, 60, 90, depending on who qualified them, how they qualified them, what right. they did. So I would ask for make sure that to have an updated pre-approval, right? Because a list agent, if you're a list agent and someone puts an offer in on your property, you want to make sure that pre-approval is very up to date. <laughs> sure. So outside of that, what loans or what types of loans is this going to affect? So this is for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac conforming conventional loans. So we don't have to worry about any of the VA or the the jumbo clients. This does this only affects so it does not affect government loans. So USDA, FHA, and VA are unaffected by this. Uh, jumbo does n is not a conforming loan mm -hmm. typically, um, and so that that is only going to be affected by the rules in which whoever's making the jumbo and so forth. So no, you don't have to worry about those ones at this point. You should always worry. <laughs> Stay tuned until Stay next tuned. time. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of outcome do you think this is going to bring for clients? Well, so I, I do. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are tightening the pool, mm -hmm. right? They're saying, look, you got to be a little bit more, better put together, you know, marginal borrowers. And they do this based on statistics. They look at the, the loans that fall out or have problems typically when there's a downturn in the market and they make rules and guidelines so that they can prevent, you know, massive amounts of foreclosures, short sales and things like that. So they're just preparing to and, and making sure people are properly set up and qualified. Um, so they have a very strong pool of loans out there. And this is good for the economy too. Good for the economy, how? Well, I mean, if people default or marginal borrowers and default on loans, that mm -hmm. doesn't help anyone. Certainly. Yep. So what's one piece of advice or one takeaway that you can tell our listeners or what they should know going forward? Well, on this piece, and we haven't gotten to the pricing yet, but on this piece, you know, they should <laughs> the they should definitely make sure if if your your credit score is under seven hundred, you know, if you're putting less than twenty percent down. Um, if your debt to income is a little on the higher side, I'd say anything over 40%, mm -hmm. um, definitely over 45%. Just make sure, double check that your that your loan officer, that the lender you're working with has updated your pre pre approval. Just get make sure pre approval is updated. And if you haven't talked to a loan officer recently, it, what what's that kind of time frame look like? If you've gotten your pre approval and weeks have gone by or a month has gone by. I would still say I would suggest reach out to your loan officer or your lender and and, and update your pre approval. Okay, well let's let's focus a little bit more on the pricing piece that you okay. had mentioned too. What does that mean? So loans are all risk based pricing. They're they're based on the risk. Okay, so if you have a higher credit score, typically your rate's going to be better than if you have a lower credit score. And the way they price these out, they're called loan level pricing adjusters. Another acronym LLPA. You don't have to remember <laughs> that. There will be no test. <laughs> But the LLPAs, uh, Fannie Mae is updating and changing. Mm 
And one major difference that they have this time that they haven't had, as far as I've been in the business, is they're actually giving you a pricing hit or a pricing disadvantage for your debt to income ratio. Well, that sounds bad. Well, so if your debt to income <laughs> ratio is high, that's a higher risk. Right. Right. So your, your risk of default, if you have a lot of debt out there, is higher than if you don't. So they are giving a pricing hit or adjustment to the negative, or, or you would have a slightly higher rate if your debt to income is over 45%. Okay. And so these pricings, we're seeing them implemented now. Now, they say it's for the delivery of loans to Fannie Mae after May 1st, but those loans aren't typically sold to Fannie Mae right away. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing them priced into loans right now. So even though it's going to be May 1st, we should just account for it. Well, that's, being here and now. Well, that's sold May 1st. And I don't mean to confuse you, but mm -hmm. you know, loans have to be made and closed, priced, made and closed, and then sold to Fannie Mae. So if you think about it, May 1st, it's really not that far away. Right around the corner. Right around the corner. <laughs> and so loans are pricing right now with those adjustments in them. Okay. Yeah. So let me give you, I got some notes here. I don't typically like to work off notes, but here we go. <laughs> um, there's some updated credit fees for condos, right? Um, investment properties. And, and there's, here's a, here's a fact. Second homes, you know, you know, the second home is defined as a place that you can go to. That's not your primary for your uninterrupted use. So you and can't, it's, and it's also not an investment property. Correct. You can't rent out a second home. Right. So if you're buying a second home, a lake home, a beach home, a mountain home, you know, something that has some kind of you know, uh, um, uh, gosh, recreational rec activity yes. associated recreational with it. <laughs> activities are a reason to buy. Like maybe you're buying a second home where you're, where you have grandkids or something like that. Yeah. Well, they used to have the same pricing as primary residences. Mm -hmm. Well, now they don't. I think Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac caught up to people's thought process and understand Airbnb and all these things. And now they're pricing them the exact same as an investment property. Wow. And it actually, and people are going to hate me for saying this, but it makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> Right, because they're going out. They're they're a lot of these people are actually renting out these properties. Right, so they don't want to give them a, an incentive for fraud for property, which means that they're buying it really as an investment, but they're saying it's a second home. Right, and that was happening um, at a very high rate. And Fannie Mae found also investigated by the FBI. Probably not a good idea. That to do is it. investigated by the FBI. <laughs> Mortgage fraud is is bad. Is don't a federal do it. Offense. <laughs> FBI will be all up on your on your junk. So on your you know what. Okay, so the, the main things we're talking about here, you know, investment and second homes are going to be priced the same. Okay. You know, if you have a higher debt to income, you know, this sounds adverse logic. If you have a higher debt to income, you should have a better price because you can't afford it as much. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're but you don't because it's risky. <laughs> it's higher risk. If, you, if all your money goes out every month and you have no savings and you don't have any, you know, think about that 45% debt to income. Well, that's off your gross income. Right. It's not your. It's not actually what you take home. No one takes home what their paycheck at the top of the paycheck. They take home what's at the bottom of the paycheck, right. and it's typically thirty percent less. Right. Than what's at the top. All right. So the credit fees uh, greater than you know greater debt to incomes. Um, you know you're going to see adjustments on credit scores, loan to values, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to better understand this, you know, t reach out to your loan officer, have them go over a pricing matrix with you. Really see like if you're a borrower, if you're looking to buy a house. You know, where, where do I have to be to have optimal pricing? Mm -hmm. Okay. So where do I have to be to have optimal pricing? Where should my credit score be? Where should my debt to income be? And you look at it that way. Don't just run out and find the house of your dreams and say, I'm gonna, I got to have that house at all costs. It's kind of doing everything backwards. If doing you, everything if backwards. that approach, right? Right. And don't, I mean, what the biggest mistake I see people make is they tell the loan officer wh where they want to buy a house. And I understand want and need mm -hmm. are two different things, but- I would ask the loan officer, wh where is my optimal range? Mm -hmm. You know, where is my optimal range if I want my payment to be around this? You know, and then the loan officer might say, look, you, that, that payment, you can't qualify for that payment. So then what? Right. right. And if you go out and buy a house or look for a house, and we, I've heard this before, they're like, well, I don't want to do pre approval until I find the house. I'm like, <laughs> That's adverse to logic. Yeah, putting putting the cart before the horse. There, I'd yeah. rather I'd rather not. I mean, naturally, people are going to stretch to try and get you know sure. the things that they want, but it makes a little bit more sense to actually have a conversation about what you can do within your means and then find something from there. Right, and if you qualify, that's great. But the, there's nothing worse than saying you know finding the house of your dreams and finding out that it's above your your means. Right, didn't mean to rhyme there, but it's true. You know, <laughs> worked out well.
Kind of. It, it does kind of bring me back to a lot of the conversations we have with our real estate partners uh, and just saying, oh, well, I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to upset them by asking how much they could qualify for. Well, doesn't it make sense not to be the dream crusher on, on the back end I, just by having a conversation on the front end? Well, yeah, they don't have to, to be the dream crusher. They just let the loan officer let be, be the dream, dream crushers. crushers. <laughs> I hate, I don't like crushing dreams, but we like to help people figure out how to get into the home. Yeah. But, you know, that might be, that might take a couple months of paying off debt and improving credit score mm -hmm. and things like that. But if you just rush out and say, I'm going to buy a home, you haven't really done anything to improve your position, right. you know, save money, pay off debt or whatever it may be, um, th th there will be a corresponding effect and the effect isn't always good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's like saying, oh, I'm going to go run the Boston Marathon, but I haven't trained a day in my life yet. Right. That, that's a Gotta challenge. Got to get the right shoes, the right outfit, start the right routine. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot that goes into that. For sure. Good. What else do we have? Well, that's all I had for you today. Cool. Well, look, um, thanks everyone for tuning in. If you found value in this podcast, in this video, or however you're consuming it, please like, share, um, send it to someone who might benefit from it. Uh, head over to our website, morganfinancial.net forward slash keeping your business on track and watch all of our, you can watch all of our nonsense <laughs> in one place. It's, it's like on Netflix. It's like, are you still watching? Are you still listening? You can see, you can consume all of it. All of it. You can binge watch. I mean, there's, if you got nothing going on this weekend, please, please uh, binge watch our episodes. Yeah, or yeah. forward to a friend. Let us know how you felt about that. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Bye.